Thank you for the introduction. And I'd also like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this conference. Uh, Singapore is a wonderful place that I always enjoy to visit. Uh, I'd also uh, like to say one word because it's the special uh, conference in honor of, of Ted and Hugh. Uh, so for those that don't know, Ted was my advisor. Uh, and uh, I would like to say it was a great uh, honor and a pleasure to be a student uh, of Ted's uh, and to learn so much from him. Uh, and I uh, just want to keep things short, but I'll just say I really appreciate Ted uh, as a mathematician, as a mentor, and as a friend. All right, so talk about uh, determined Borel sets and measurability. Uh, I'll say that this talk is mostly talk about determined Borel sets. Uh, the measurability is here because this is the sort of, uh, you know, the next, next step in sort of filling out the picture of what happens uh, in this determined Borel set uh, universe. Um, but for those that have seen uh, me talk about the topic of determined Borel sets in the context of category, uh, there's not a ton different that comes up in the measure theoretic case. Uh, so mostly I'm going to talk about uh, the setup, the motivation for why, for okay, what is a determined Borel set and why uh, we might want to study such a thing. Um, and then get a few remarks about uh, some, just the, the small differences that come up as you uh, try to extend those results uh, into the measure case. All right, so <clears throat> this talk concerns Borel sets uh, in the context of reverse math. So the standard definition for a Borel set in reverse math is a Borel set is a well-founded tree that has some labels. Uh, so the leaves are labeled with clopen sets, and the nodes of the tree are labels labeled with uh, intersections or unions uh, in order to describe how to build up the Borel set out of clopen pieces. <clears throat> All right, so um, just some notation for this. So by T sigma, I want to denote the uh, sort of sub Borel code that lies below sigma. Um, so if I have this uh, you know, whole tree coding a Borel set, then sigma is just coding some, T sigma is just coding some set that was used uh, in the construction of, of the, the set as a whole. Um, and this uh, notation will use the, the set itself that's coded by that tree. All right, so what does it mean to say that X is an element of a Borel set? Well, you have to know pretty much for every uh, start, you know, starting from the leaves and then working your way up to the root, you have to know for every set that was used to build up the Borel set, is X in there? Um, and then you know, say, okay, well, I know that X is you know, in one of these sets. It's a union. Okay, so I know that X is in this next set. Um, and eventually you figure out, oh, yeah, X is in or out. <clears throat> so this is a process uh, that uses uh, arithmetic transfinite recursion uh, sort of naturally uh, in order to, to carry it out. Uh, so, to be really specific, because this is going to be sort of the, the, uh, the kind of object that we need to use uh, throughout the entire talk, uh, the specific way that ATR does it is there's this process of arithmetic transfinite recursion where you build a function uh, whose input is the nodes of the tree and output to 0, 1, so 0 for out, 1 for in, where if sigma is a leaf, then the value of the function is 1 if and only if x is in the set that is the clopen set that is coded at that leaf. So remember, the leaf has a label. Um, and the label is a clopen set. And here, this um, T sigma bars just uh, is denoting that clopen set. All right. And then you just proceed by arithmetic transfinite recursion at unions. You say it's in the set if, for some n, it was in one of the sets that was used to build up the union. And then the complementary uh, definition for the intersection. Okay, so therefore, what it means for X to be an element uh, of a Borel set, it means there exists an evaluation map that obeys the logic of the tree and is correct at the, at the uh, clopen sets, uh, at the leaves, and such that if I look at what the evaluation map does at the root, then it's a one. It's in the set. Okay, so membership in a Borel set is a sigma one one statement, or sig sigma one one predicate. Inverse math, uh, and, and I guess and I guess classically. All right, then just uh, a sort of thing to note: if, if you have a note for if you have a code for a Borel set, you can easily get a code for its complement just by swapping all unions and intersections, and by taking complements at the leaves. 
All right, so uh, there's a lot of symmetry between a code for Braille set and the code for its complement. Um, so we go back and forth between this. Okay, so <clears throat> the way that, that uh, Braille sets are typically uh, developed in reverse math is we say, okay, uh, in order to, to make sense of this Borel set, we need ATR in order to have the evaluation maps in order to know whether the X's are in or out of the sets. So most uh, development of Borel sets takes place like with ATR as a base theory. Uh, and there's a good reason for that. So there's a, a very uh, silly proposition. Um, so uh, this, uh, these authors will, will appear a couple times. This is um, Demir Jafarov, uh, Stephen Flood, uh, Reed Solomon uh, and myself, um, but th this, this, this proposition is, is uh, very short proof, but it's also a very silly thing. Basically, you can write a Borel code for the empty set that is so convoluted and weird that in order to uh, find an evaluation map for any x in that set, you have to compute zero to the alpha, where alpha is whatever ordinal you chose in advance. So these evaluation maps actually just Knowing that they exist gives you the power to compute jump hierarchies, gives you ATR kind of power. All right, so we can think of this as maybe sort of a reason why we don't study Borel sets below ATR. Anytime that you have a theorem where part of its conclusion is, so let's say in the hypothesis of the theorem, there's a Borel set, and then in the conclusion of the theorem involves some X that's like in the Borel set. Oh, already it's ATR, because just the fact that the Borel set had something in it. Okay, so this is, this is kind of silly. <clears throat> Uh, nevertheless, you know, you could uh, still want to study things about Braille sets. You might hope that some of the things that you study about them could be like stronger than ATR. You could look at something like uh, the property of bear. So recall a set A has the property of bear if there's an open set U such that the... Uh, <clears throat> oh, I'm blanking on what this... What is the English of this single symbol? Symmetric difference, thank you. So <laughs> such that the symmetric difference uh, between... <laughs> Uh, a and this uh, open set is meager. Um, so uh, it's well known every, that every Borel set has a property of bare. Um, and in reverse math, ATR is actually equivalent to this statement. Why? Well, the usual proof, every Borel set has a property of bare is by transfinite recursion. And in the other direction, if a set has a property of bare, either it or its complement is non-empty. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we can't study in reverse math the statement, every Borel set has the property of bear. Just can't be studied. Can't learn anything about the property of bear based on this. Or can we? Okay, so that's, that's what I want to uh, talk more about today, the, the, the or can we part. <clears throat> All right, so this, this slide is meant, meant to be read in a, in a movie voice. Previously, no, previously, in transfinite mathematics and systems weaker than ATR or not. Or like, no, it's not a movie. Whatever it's called. TV. Anyway, uh, so there have been some uh, work in the past where transfinite mathematics, by which I mean in a broad sense, like mathematics that discusses ordinals, um, has been considered in systems that are weaker than ATR. Um, even though, uh, you know, as with Borel sets, you know, people will often say, okay, well, if you want uh, to, uh, what, you know, what's the right system for studying things like having to do with ordinals? Well, it's ATR because all of the nice things about ordinals, such as comparability of ordinals and so on, uh, are uh, equivalent to ATR. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, some people, some people have, have, have tried to go, to go lower. So um, here's has a, a survey of, uh, Many, many different things about order, ordinal arithmetic in which he points out, with a very few, few very interesting exceptions, most theorems of ordinal arithmetic are either provable in RCA or equivalent to ATR. Okay, so maybe it's nice to know when something about ordinals is actually true uh, in RCA as opposed to like bring you all the way up uh, to ATR. Um, another paper that was in, this, in the same sort of theme of like, okay, well, you know, sometimes things just really have ordinals and you really need ATR in order to talk about them was a paper by Greenberg um, and Montalban. Uh, so general statements about some of these uh, well-founded trees, superatomic Boolean algebras, et cetera, are equivalent to ATR. Uh, so you need ordinals in order to do them. Um, but I'll note that as like a part of that analysis, uh, 
they needed to do some effective transfinite recursions um, in ACA, you know, in order to, to prove these reversals. All right, so sometimes uh, we might want to know something about uh, what's going on lower than ATR, even if ultimately we're going to say, all right, ATR is the most natural system to consider something. Um, and finally, Simpson has uh, <coughs> also uh, sor uh, sort of considered, um, uh, so me me measure theoretic regularity. So Burrell, a Borel set uh, satisfies measure theoretic regularity if it has uh, an F sigma set of the same measure uh, contained within it. Uh, all all Borel sets satisfy this. Um, but he defined an MTR model as a model of measure theoretic uh, regularity um, using sort of a, a, a computability criterion, saying for every X uh, in the model and every uh, like well-founded tree that's computable from X coding a Borel set, there is something else in the model that can compute uh, an F sigma set that is uh, uh, contained within that and of the same measure. Um, I believe it's just well-founded. <clears throat> Uh, so, 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 so anyway, so maybe, you know, maybe, maybe there's, there, there's some interest in knowing what happens uh, below a tier. Then this, this list is not uh, an exhaust, uh, exhaustive by any means, but it's just sort of what I, what I, what I found looking around uh, people looking at, at this kind of thing uh, without assuming ATR at the outset. We actually ran into uh, this issue of uh, wanting to uh, consider Borel sets without ATR uh, through a different direction, which was uh, through studying the borel dual ramsey theorem. So this slide has a lot of black and a lot of gray, and the black parts are the parts where, um, that will be used in future slides, and the gray parts are the parts that you can safely ignore uh, if you feel like it. Um, so, uh, because this talk's not about the borel dual ramsey theorem, but I want you to notice something about the form of the borel dual ramsey theorem. So the borel dual ramsey theorem of Carlson and Simpson states that uh, any time that we take the collection of k element, uh, of partitions of omega into exactly k pieces, which you can basically think of as kind of like Cantor space. Right? For the purposes of this, just, just think of it as, as, as kind of Cantor space. It can be coded in Cantor space in a natural way. So any time that you can take this uh, set of partitions of omega into exactly k pieces, Anytime you can represent it as a finite union of Borel sets, then you can always find a partition uh, of omega into infinitely many pieces such that every coarsening of it down to exactly k pieces has the same color. Uh, <clears throat> in other words, is an element of the ith Borel set. Okay, so we're seeing this pattern again. In the hypothesis, we have some Borel sets. In the conclusion, we have the assertion that after you know a lot of uh, you know, hypotheses, blah, 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 eventually we do learn that, in fact, one of those sets has something in it. Is this ATR? Well, actually, no. Notice that the hypothesis of this theorem actually precludes us from using the same cheap trick uh, that I used in order to uh, get, a, so get sort of a nothing result about the property of Bayer. Namely, in the hypothesis, we had to say that every every one of these uh, partitions actually did belong to a Borel set of which these CIs are, are, are component members. In other words, in order to satisfy the hypothesis of the borel dual ramsey theorem, <clears throat> the Borel sets in question have to already have their evaluation maps present in the model. If you don't know from the beginning that for every x that you can tell where, you know, what it does. If you don't know that in the beginning, then it's not an instance of the Borel dual Ramsey theorem. Oh, so we can't use that, we can't use that cheap trick. Um, and in fact, we will uh, see that the, at least for um, small values of K, uh, the Borel dual Ramsey theorem will actually be weaker than ATR. So this gives also some motivation to, to consider, consider Borel sets without assuming ATR. Um, so, and how can we consider Braille sets without assuming ATR? Well, we get the clue exactly from this theorem. So what if um, instead of considering theorems about Borel sets to have just a Borel set in the hypothesis, so just arbitrary well-founded tree, what if instead we insist when we talk about theorems uh, involving Borel sets that those sets be determined? Namely, that the model already knows that every x is either in or out of the set that's in question. If, if, a, if a Borel set uh, 
So if a Braille set doesn't uh, have an evaluation map for some X, or if a code for Braille set doesn't have an evaluation map for some X, then we'll just say, okay, that Braille set is defective, not really a Braille set, we won't consider it, we won't use those instances um, when we're considering the strength of the fit. Okay, so Braille set uh, coded by T is called determined <coughs> if for every element of Cantor space it has an evaluation map in the tree. All right, so for this talk, we are mostly gonna take uh, ACA as the base theory. And notice that in ACA, if you have an evaluation map, then that evaluation map uh, is unique. Because uh, if you had two different evaluation maps, you could use the ACA to follow like where they're different, where they're different, where they're different, uh, and find a path through the tree that way. So if a model thinks the tree is well-founded and also satisfies ACA, then if there's one uh, evaluation map, then there's actually a unique evaluation map there. Um, so this changes set membership in a Borel set from a sigma 1, 1 predicate now to a delta 1, 1 predicate. Because if you know the evaluation map exists, you can also quantify over all evaluation maps. Uh, so <clears throat> the, the complexity of membership in the Borel set gets you know, more, more close to, to what it should be. <clears throat> all right, so now we can go back to that... Uh, every Borel set has the property of bear that was uh, considered in such an unsatisfactory manner a few, a few slides ago, um, and see what happens if uh, instead we use this definition of determined Borel set uh, in the same place. So let DPB be the statement that every determined Borel set has the property of bear. Notice, RCA proves that for every determined Borel set, either it or its complement is non-empty. Just take some x, it has an evaluation map. It's in or out. Done. All right. So we we removed that pathology from the previous uh, from the previous slide. Um, and uh, in fact, we showed that actually uh, we, we 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 got somewhere with this. Uh, so this is a joint work uh, with uh, Eric Astor, Demir Jafarov, uh, Antonio Maltaban, Reed Solomon, uh, and myself. Uh, so we show that there is an omega model of this determined property of bear um, in which ATR fails. Um, and we also show not only that uh, this uh, you know, prop, uh, determined property of bear is strictly weaker than ATR, but it has kind of some thematic content. So if we think about the property of bear as being like related to category uh, in some way, uh, it may be nice to know that if you have an omega model uh, of this uh, determined property of bear, it's hyperarithmetically closed, but it also has to contain uh, a delta one one generic. Right, so somehow saying that every every Borel set has a good category approximation is the, also the same as saying that yeah, and then there are elements that uh, do the typical behavior uh, for these. Uh, uh, yeah, for, 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 for these Comega approximations. <clears throat> yes? It does, it does, yeah. This is, this is, I, I stated the simpler version. It said the more, the full one says every mega model of, a, of DPB, for every Z that is in the model, there is a delta one, one generic Z, delta one, one generic relative to Z also in the model. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> this is this is real delta one one because um, no just I'll 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 leave it real real delta one. Okay. Um, so we can also apply this analysis to learn something about that uh, Borel dual Ramsey theorem. So the borel dual ramsey theorem uh, can be kind of decomposed into two, into two parts. There's the part where you say that every Borel set has the property of bear. And then there's the part where you apply the bear version of the dual ramsey theorem. So, so the, the dual ramsey theorem has a stronger version that says, actually, if you partition the uh, set of, omega, of partitions of omega into k, whatever that set was, if you partition that set into pieces that just have the property of bear, that's enough for the Borel-Ramsey theorem uh, to be true. So 
or excuse me, that, that, that's enough for the conclusion to be true. So what you can do is you can start out with a Borel partition, apply every Borel set has the property of Baer to get the, that co-meager approximation uh, to the Borel sets, and then from that co-meager approximation, apply sort of the combinatorial core of the dual Ramsey theorem in order to get out the, the homogeneous object. Now, for most values of K, um, so K, K being the number of partitions that you partition omega into, um, for most values of K, the strength of that uh, combinatorial core is totally unknown and might be like very large. Uh, I guess it's known to be provable within pi 11 one CA, but like beyond that, like, you know, who knows. But for small values of K, uh, it's actually known that the combinatorial part uh, can be done uh, within, within ATR, and it, it can actually be done with less. It can be done with, with ACA plus. Uh, so th those, those two things put together tell us that, that ATR is enough to imply uh, the borel dual ramsey theorem, at least for just three partitions, because ATR is enough to say that every Borel set has the property of Baer, and then uh, ACA plus is enough to, to do the combinatorial part for that specific K equals three. Okay, so here's, so here's an example of a theorem that that involves Borel sets lies below ATR. Um, in that same paper, we show that actually the same, even the same model that we construct to separate the determined property of Baer from ATR, in that model, the borel dual ramsey theorem for uh, three partitions uh, also holds. So the same model also gives a separation uh, between borel dual ramsey theorem for three partitions and ATR. All right, so that's kind of nice. There's not that many, uh, there's not that many theorems, oh, next, I have to put the next. But it's still, it is still true, as we also show in this same paper, that every omega model of the borel dual ramsey theorem for three partitions, um, every omega model still has to be hyperarithmetically closed. Okay, so this is kind of cool. There's not, there's not really like too many, um, what we call theorems of ordinary mathematics, theorems where like logical things don't appear in the definition that sort of lie below ATR but still have um, all of the models hyperarithmetically closed. Um, one thing that we don't know uh, is whether this uh, Borel dual Ramsey theorem for three partitions uh, is a theorem of is a, a theorem of hyperarithmetic analysis uh, or not. Um, so for any that, that don't know what a theory of hyperarithmetic analysis is, this question um, be, by the stuff above, this question just boils it down to asking. Is, del is delta one one of x a model of this principle for all x? Like, so we don't know if height is a model uh, of the of the Borel dual Ramsey theorem. Um, and the the issue is that there are sets in hype that hype thinks are determined Borel sets, but that actually have ill-founded trees associated with them, and that actually have no like meaningful category approximation within hype. So that uh, two-step process of given the Borel set, first find the category approximation and then apply the combinatorial theorem uh, fails at the first step. So we don't really know what happens for these very strange uh, determined Borel sets that hype thinks are determined Borel sets but are actually. Uh... So if, if your tree is actually well-founded, then, um, then it has an actual co-meager approximation, um, and the model um, being hyperarithmetically closed will find it, and then the usual thing will go through. So it's really only these, only these weird ones that are, that are the issue. <clears throat> okay, and then uh, finally, it's natural also to consider another regularity property uh, of Borel sets, uh, which is that they are measurable. Um, and uh, I'll put as an aside now, I'll come back to this uh, a bit later. There are a couple of things uh, that you could mean if you sit down to formalize every Borel set is measurable. Um, or at least there, there, there were a couple of things that, that, that stood out to me, like, oh, maybe this, maybe this. And, and those things were equivalent over ACA. So again, taking ACA as, as a base theory, um, and I, I'll, I'll say one of them later, but taking ACA as a base theory, we have a whoops, notion of measurability, uh, of what it means to say that a, a determined Borel set is measurable. Um, and so under this uh, pretty natural definition, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, you can get the very uh, similar kinds of results uh, <clears throat> using, using basically the same methods, but, now, but methods having to do now with uh, randoms uh, and measure oneness instead of uh, generics and co-meagerness. 
<clears throat> and of course, the the uh, general the relativized version of this is uh, also uh, true. <clears throat> okay, so uh, these are these are the results, and uh, about halfway through the slides, and about halfway through the time, which is good. Uh, so. I want to use the rest of the time to make some indication uh, about how these results are proved um, and say a little bit about what goes different between measure and category, but which is not too much. <clears throat> All right, so let's start with the, the simplest, simplest one. So I claim that any time that you have an omega model of these principles, then they are always hyperarithmetically closed. Um, so this follows uh, from a slightly stronger statement. Actually, both of these principles apply a principle known as L omega 1 omega CA, for those who, who know what that is. Um, but the, the proof of that, as well as the proof of, um, of being closed under hyperarithmetic reduction, uh, is actually very similar in character to the proof that the determined property of Bayer implies ACA. So I'm just going to show you that the determined property of Bayer implies ACA. Uh, and you'll get get most of most of the picture. So, I want to define uh, a determined Borel set so that any co-meager approximation to that set uh, computes zero jump. Uh, or at least I'm going to assume that I get a co-meager approximation to the set and a co-meager approximation to its complement, because both the set and its complement, uh, you know, are around in the model. I'll get a co-meager approximation to each one. All right. So here's the set that I'm going to use. Uh, I'll define uh, for each pair N and S a clopen set by saying that uh, this clopen set is going to be the cylinder above zero to the N one if uh, by stage S I have seen that N enters zero jump and otherwise it will be the empty set. And I'm going to take the union of all of these. Okay, so if I were to like draw a picture of what this set uh, looks like in Cantor space, so in Cantor space, we have uh, zero to the omega, which is definitely out of this set. None of the clopen sets uh, contain zero to the omega. And then uh, for each branching off point, so we go up n zeros and then branch, branch off and get a one, go up n zeros, branch off and get a one, the cone above there gets included into the set if and only if n is in zero jump. And so this is n many zeros. <clears throat> All right, eventually some clopen set comes along uh, to, put, to put that set in if, if n is in zero jump. Okay, so if I, now let's suppose that I got a co-meager approximation both to this set and to its complement. Well, any co-meager approximation to this set has to be dense above each uh, zero to the n1 for which n is in zero jump. And it can't have anything, not, not, none of it can appear above some n such that n is not in zero jump. On the other hand, if I look at the co-meager approximation for the complement, exactly the complementary thing is true. So if I look at co-meager approximation for the complement of this set, if I go above any n that's in zero jump, that co-meager approximation has to have nothing. And for any n that's out, it has to be dense. Okay, so given those two co-meager approximations, now I compute zero jump by just saying, okay, I want to know whether n is in zero jump. I go in there and I start seeing if I run into one of my co-meager approximations. Well, their union is dense, so I'm going to find one of them uh, if, I, if I look long enough. And whichever one I find, that one tells me whether n is in or out. Because in each region, only one of them is allowed to have something. <clears throat> this uses the fact that the bare category theorem holds in RCA also, by the way. We're sort of saying like, oh, you know, we're going to have <clears throat> more, the, the more formal uh, version of, of determined property of Bayer says we're going to have the co-meager approximation, uh, the, you know, the open set that approximates the set, and we also need to be given the uh, sequence of dense open sets on which that approximation would be correct. So if, 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 if the, the, the claims that I'm making, the claims that I'm making, right, like that, 
if you take the co-meter approximation for the complement, it's not allowed to have anything here. Well, if it had something here, then I could go in there and then go meet all the dense sets in RCA and come up with a contradiction. Okay, so there's the, the sketch of that for, uh, for ACA. <clears throat> All right, so now I wanna get into uh, the method of construction of those models that separate uh, ATR uh, and these principles. So in order to look at how those models work, it's informative to consider how, to consider like in great gory detail how it is that ATR uh, manages to uh, come up with these uh, co-meager approximations uh, or measure approximations to a given set. All right, so let's consider the usual proof that every Borel set has a property, has the property of bear, which is the proof that, that ATR does. So starting at the leaf, you have some clopin set that's just given to you uh, at that leaf, and we're gonna define U sigma to be a co-meager approximation for T sigma uh, to be an open approximation for T sigma and V sigma to be a, uh, an open approximation for the complement and we'll build both of them simultaneously as we go up the tree. So you start out by saying, all right, if sigma is a leaf, then I actually know exactly what the set is and I'm gonna, so I'm gonna let my approximation at the leaf just be that set, let the approximation, uh, let the approximation of the complement just be the complement, everything's clopen, so everything is sort of very pretty right now. Then what do we do at unions? Well. If I'm given open approximations for uh, T sigma N for each N, then if I just take their union, I get something that is an open approximation for uh, the union of those sets. Um, and I can do a complementary thing um, at intersections, right? If I, because I, if, if I'm looking at intersection, then in the complement, I'm also taking a union. So I can get an open approximation that way. Now, if I know that uh, this is an open approximation for a given set, and I want to know an open approximation for its complement, then, well, you can just use one jump to say, well, what are the places where this open approximation doesn't have anything? Those are the places where the complement is dense. And, it just, and so it just, just takes a jump to do that. And then um, what you do when you sort of, so you apply ATR, you build all of these things, you get to the top, then when you look back and you see like everything that you've created, you end up with two things. One, what you have at the root does give you an open approximation for uh, the set and an open approximation for its complement. But also, if you look across the whole ensemble, you can uh, compute a sequence of dense open sets where as long as you meet all of those, so it's the dense open sets to make this, you know, going from here to here correct, the dense open sets to make going from here to here correct, and so on, just take all of them together, and you get a collection of dense open sets on which uh, this, uh, this root, root approximation is correct. All right, so, so, we're, so we're talking about eff effective mathematics right now, so the, the, the point is that if you, can build, if you can build this object, then from this object, you can read off the, the, thing, the things that you need in order to, to get that uh, bare category conclusion. And, and there's some, some freedom here, okay? The way that ATR does it is to let U sigma be a union of sigma n's here, but it doesn't have to do it that way. Actually, as long as you come up with any object that just has the property that U sigma and union N of U sigma N are dense in the same places. Then that object will similarly allow you to read off uh, a solution at the end. Okay, so this is the object that ATR creates uh, in order to uh, show that every Borel set has a property of bear. And it's, uh, you know, more, uh, you know, it's an object that has more stuff in it than the stuff that you read off of it at the end. So the first question that you could ask yourself is, you know, along lines of trying to separate this is, okay, do we really need to create like this entire object? Could we get away somehow with like creating less than this and shortcutting in order to get to the property of bear? Um, and uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the answer is no. We can't shortcut the creation of an object such as this. Um, you can show uh, in, in ACA that a, any, if, if every Borel set has a property of bear, then, then this extended object always exists as well. 
and, and basically all that you do is you take, you take, you take your tree and you take all the subtrees and, and you do something like this. And you give each subtree like a different part of the Cantor space and you just put all of the subtrees there. And then it's sort of forced to give you Comigo approximations to all the subtrees, which is essentially, uh, you know, which essentially gives you, you know, a object that's a Comigo approximation to each subtree and gives you the, you know, the entire uh, kind, of, kind of thing. Okay, so that means that the task is, this, this object, it has to be there, right? This whole like extended thing, we have to have it. But we're not allowed to get it from ATR. We have to get it from some other source. We have to build a model in which it can be gotten from some other source. <clears throat> right, so, and, 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 and here's, here, here's a model where you can do that. The idea is that the model is made by basically just adjoining a whole bunch of super generic stuff together. So let G be a sigma one one generic and just consider it as like, you have like just like a whole pile of like mutually sigma one one generics. <clears throat> and then you let the model be um, what you get by taking any finite collections of them, taking stuff that you can make delta one one in those finite collections and unioning all of that together. So everything in this model um, has something in the model that is delta one one generic relative to it. So the idea is that we're gonna build this <clears throat> uh, extended object instead of building it like from the roots uh, using ATR, we're gonna build it all at once by using a sufficiently generic that also exists in the model, and we're gonna, we're gonna poll it. We're, we're gonna, gonna let it vote. We're gonna sort of put, put initial segments in front of it so that it like starts out in different places in the set, and then ask it, okay, were you in or out? Were you in or out? Were you in or out? And because this, uh, because this thing is, is super generic compared to the definition of the set. Uh, at least the idea is, it's actually gonna do the co-meager behavior. So we can discover <clears throat> simultaneously for all sigma in T, uh, <clears throat> well, okay, so there, there's maybe, for, for, for some sigma, maybe the, the, you know, the, the, the co-meager approximation hasn't been decided yet. Maybe, maybe for some sigma, you could continue in one way and co-meager and you know, have you know, part of the open approximation for being out of the set and continue in another way and have part of the open approximation for being in the set. You, know, you get this far, it's not decided yet. Okay? But if you get to a point, if you get to a point where no matter how you start the generic uh, after that point, the generic ends up uh, in the tree, then you know that you've hit the, you, you, you know, you've hit a point that uh, where, in which the original set uh, is co-meager. <clears throat> okay, so you pull the generics, you get this uh, sort of extended, extended object, which was sort of the result of the gen generics voting on where to go, and it turns out that this extended object works. Now, I'm hiding, I'm hiding a lot of details here. Oh, I'm not, I'm not sure. <clears throat> okay, so there's, uh, there's some proving to do about, about this. So, uh, for example, the, so the things that I'm saying about like, oh, you know, well, the generics will just eventually sort of agree, like above this P, you know, like, for example, like this, this set will be non-empty. Uh, either for the set or its complement. Like, you know, the generics will eventually, like, kind of start, like, doing the same thing. Like, you know, all of this you sort of need to, uh, you need to do something to, you know, to prove that. But this is sort of the, the, the outline of the proof. Okay. <clears throat> all right, so let's take a look um, at a similar idea for measure. So, <clears throat> unlike with, uh, the property of bear, uh, this I think for me, it's not, it's not immediately obvious like how you should formalize uh, every Borel set is measurable. I mean, there, there are a couple options. But let, let's start out with this one. This, so we, we, can, we can define measure, measurability for Borel sets uh, using regularity. So it's a, a fact about Lebesgue measurability is, is a set is Lebesgue measurable if and only if uh, you can find two pi zero two sets, so like one set to approximate the given set and the other to approximate its complement. 
uh, so such that the, the complement of one, this is like your F sigma that's uh, contained uh, in the given set, and then the set's contained in this G delta. Um, and uh, together, uh, a, union, a union C is, is everything. And so these conditions together are, are also enough to imply that the measure of the intersection of, of A and C will be zero. So I just did it with two delta zero two sets to uh, keep the symmetry. Uh. <clears throat> okay, so for the moment, let, let, let's take this as our definition of measurability. See? No, okay, you're right. I should I should add that that the intersection is zero. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I want so I, I I do want that there. Okay, so let's take so let's take that uh, definition now. If if your Borel set is determined, then you know these uh, inclusions then you know just become okay. Like we can tell who's in A or A complement because it's just like a, a simple set. So that's uh, you know just a. You know, Pi zero two statement, uh, and then the membership in in B. We know that we can tell those things, so we, you know this uh, this is meaningful in that context. All right. Well, how does ATR show that every Borel set is measurable? Like in the constructive manner of like how does ATR show that uh, for every Borel set you can find these delta zero two sets? Well, it's basically the, the same kind of story, right? You start out at the leaves where it's very easy to do, and then. Uh, Arith you know, an arithmetic procedure uh, at each union or intersection is enough to give you like the next approximation. You get to the top, you have approx an approximation that works for the whole set. But then furthermore, just like uh, in the case with category, if you look down over the like entire tree of what you've constructed, then yeah, you can read off a whole bunch of null sets, which uh, if you throw them away, then uh, the, the, the set at the top like, will, will do what you need it to do. So by, by, by throw them away, I mean include these null sets into both A and C, so that you essentially are making no claim about what's happening on those null sets. And then on the remainder, uh, everything turns out okay. <clears throat> All right, so um, again, in the same way, if we want to separate these two principles, um, so just as before, you can show that whole sequence is going to have to be created. Uh, you can't get away with, with producing less than that. So again, we need a model that has another way of producing such a sequence. <clears throat> so the proof starts out basically the same. Uh, so except that instead of, you, instead of making a model that has a bunch of like super generic stuff in it, we make a model that has a bunch of super random stuff in it, specifically pi 1 1 randoms. And so we're going to try to do sort of the same procedure as before, uh, given a code for a determined Borel set and some sigma in it, um, pick uh, one of these things that's uh, in the model that's way out, you know, past where T was defined so that it's random relative to T. And now we want to use this guy uh, in order to pull, uh, in order to pull the set. And the first thing that we notice is that we don't really get uh, anything like quite so nice is what happened uh, in the generic case. So in general, like we could hope that these generics are nice enough that for any sigma, if we, or excuse me, we could hope that these randoms are nice enough that uh, for, yeah, that for any sigma and for any like part of Cantor space where we decide to uh, sort of like let the, let the randoms loose and then see like where they land, you know, probably the best that we could hope for is just get some kind of like averaging thing. Like, oh, well, we'll kind of figure out what is the measure of this set above this point? Um, but you know that's not that's not a pair of, of delta zero two sets yet. <clears throat> All right. So the different uh, different kind of object that we get, or that we that we can hope to get, um, and that with with some effort we, we we can prove that we that we can get, um, is the object that given as input um, some you know part of the Decom some, some part of the uh, code for the Borel set and some part of Cantor space that we're interested in um, will uniformly tell us uh, what the measure is on that space. Um, that's more like the object that we're going to get. And at a first glance, it seems like that object has lost some information. Right? It's sort of, you know, if, if you just know like the measure of a set uh, on various, 
like subsets, then on a measure zero set, um, anything could be happening. Right? So how, how can you find the measure zero set where things are bad so that you can get rid of it? Uh, so it turns out that uh, you can use the Borel code that, that if you have a Borel code around and you also have a function that has these nice properties, you can use the Borel code to help you. Um, and uh, together with the Borel code and this kind of function together, reconstruct uh, a whole sequence of, of delta zero two sets like you need. <clears throat> okay, so polling works, uh, but in the meantime, you sort of come into sort of a, uh, an entirely different, what I would call like summarizing object for uh, a Borel set. And I just want to remark that you could also use this uh, summarizing object, like the existence of such a summarizing object, as a different way of defining uh, measurability for a Borel set. You say a Borel set is measurable if some kind of like uh, integration uh, integration function exists for the Borel set and uh, on all of the uh, sub you know, sub Borel sets that were used to construct it. Um, and that seems to actually, at least if you don't assume ACA, seems to be maybe a little different than the first definition that I proposed. Um, but if you assume ACA, then, then they're equivalent. Um, but there, there is a lot of uh, work studying sort of measure theoretic principles below ACA. Um, so it might, act, it might be interesting to see if this uh, other one uh, below ACA is actually, you know, it, it might be pretty weak uh, if you don't have ACA there, but to be, to be determined. <clears throat> okay, um, so the last talk that I gave, I budgeted three minutes per slide, and at the end I was like, <laughs> so this time I budgeted three minutes per slide, and I'm pretty much done. So. The other theorem that we, uh, that we had uh, previously about the determined property of Bayer um, is this uh, theorem that any omega model contains a delta 1, 1 generic. Um, and I didn't really give more, more detail about this, though I see that I, I, I had the time to do so. Uh, but the method for doing that for uh, measurability and for the random case uh, really doesn't differ in any significant way uh, from the determined property of bare one. So it's still using this method of decorating trees, uh, which I guess I could say more about uh, if people are interested in, uh, they don't have a slide for it. Um, but the corollary uh, of this theorem, in addition to uh, just the sort of appreciating the, the thematic content of it, um, is the fact that neither, uh, neither one of these principles holds uh, in hype. Um, and so therefore they're both kind of uh, hanging out in what uh, could be considered like sort of an emerging zoo uh, between ATR and sort of in the general vicinity of the theories of hyperarithmetic analysis. All right, so that's, that's what I got. Thank you. Yes, actually, I, I had meant I had meant to mention this when I was when I was on your slide. Uh, so this. Um, Where did it go? <clears throat> so the difference, so the main difference, I, I don't know where it went. The main, the main difference is that the, is um, exactly the uh, issue that, that you raised in the question when this slide first came up. So um, the definition of uh, MTR here um, explicitly only considers those Braille sets that are truly well-founded. So, uh, so like not, not that the model thinks is well-founded, but that are actually well-founded. And in this this one, it's really about like what the model thinks. <clears throat> yeah, I mean sec second second order arithmetic, <laughs> oh, that, but that is not a model of HR not. Oh. 
Well, I'm not, I'm not sure. I didn't, I didn't think about that. Yeah, you know, now now that I uh, thought about it a little more, I realized that this, uh, at least if AC, if uh, if ACA is around, this uh, DBM will imply uh, any any omega model of DBM should be a model of MTR, because of the fact that any set that is truly Braille set is determined, right. so it'll apply to it and right, give so you the. Yeah, So for that, I would say that it depends uh, precisely on which version of DPM um, you want to take, uh, because uh, you've constructed MTR models. And this was the thing I forgot to mention in the slide when it came up, um, that the Simpsons constructed H uh, Omega models of this MTR um, sort of at every uh, level. So uh, like satisfying weak Kernig's lemma, but not, oh, sorry, sorry, satisfying weak, weak Kernig's lemma, but not weak Kernig's lemma. Satisfying weak Kernig's lemma, but not ACA. Satisfying ACA but not ATR. So it's sort of, this, so, a, a, the, the, those low ones sort of get down, so I, I just assumed ACA as a base theory, like, throughout this. So I can't say, like, for sure what happens below ACA, but my suspicion is that there might be some differences there. So, it, so if if uh, if you only have three partitions, um, then it's it's known to follow from Heinemann's theorem. Uh, so, and 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 actually, the amusing the amusing story that the the, the way that we know that is. Uh, uh, well, L Ludovic mentioned it to us. He was like, oh, by the way, did, did you notice that Heinemann's theorem can prove this like combinatorial version for the, the three? And then he said that the way that he noticed that was that he was reading uh, uh, your paper with Simpson where you, where you mentioned without proof that, well, you had observed the Carlson-Simpson lemma was provable from Heinemann's theorem for the small, uh, like, small value. And it's basically almost the same thing, uh, <clears throat> which, <laughs> yeah. Is there a K such that if you hold for K and hold for N, then hold for K plus N? Say it for K. For K tolerance. I don't know. Yeah, could could it could be? Yeah, we don't know. I mean, if, if you say that it's both analytic and co-analytic, it means you have a proof, like, so like, you, 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 yeah, you have, you have a proof both, both ways. So, the, the, it, <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure. If you don't, because if, if you don't have, no, no, I'm thinking. Well, 
and may not be Hmm. Yeah, it's it's it, it's a good question. I haven't I haven't looked at you know at, at the at the effectiveness of of that of that uh, translation. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I need, we, we, we need, we need the omega-1 CK to not go up. So. <laughs> so, the, so, after you pull the generics and you get these objects, the method of proving that these objects uh, actually have the all of the right uh, properties, like to be to be a, like equivalent extended object, uh, depends on the fact that due to the sigma one one genericity, you're able to prove that at each level, like so for like for each sigma below a given rank, you're able to show that this collection uh, is actually a delta one one. Uh, Delta 1 1 relative to GI collection. Uh, I don't understand the question. <laughs> so the the hypothesis of the um, of the fact that omega one doesn't increase is is used in several places just to guarantee that like just to like reduce the complexity of various sets under question. So even even the fact that we can get like a collection the collection of all of these things together like you know you're 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 getting you're getting countably many facts about this about this generic. And these countably many facts are coming from evaluation maps, which maybe a different generic was needed in order to produce the evaluation map. And if that different generic had a higher omega-1 CK than the one that you have, then, I don't know, things, things, things just seem to, seem to break apart. <clears throat> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if Antonio has a, a snappy, uh, snappy answer to why it's needed. Say again. Well, we we don't we don't know if the tree is non-standard or anything. We don't know anything about it. It's just. Well, all, all the ones that I thought of, which were two. Like this? Well, that was that was that was just the that was the early slide where it's just introducing without giving any specifics. So I, yeah, so I, I, I so so I, I can tell you I've considered two definitions for measurable, and one of them is the one that is written. 
Uh, one, one is the one that is written right here, except that I should include that the measure of the intersection is zero. Um, the other one uh, is sort of uh, based on the idea of existence, existence of such uh, integrating function. But I didn't, I didn't write it out because the definition is like uh, a little uh, like grungy, I guess. I didn't, I didn't make a slide for it. I just thought uh, it's better to say it's just like something like this exists and then. <clears throat> say again? Yes. <laughs> 